Thank you for all of the incredible, incredible Christ-honoring music tonight. Uh, Dr. Willette, thank you for that. That blessed my heart. And to all of you, thank you for the great singing that you did in congregation. Please never forget, one song you sing will be the last. And very likely you won't know when it's going to be. So sing everyone as if it were your last. When we stand before him, we're going to want to say, did you hear it? Did you hear it? Don't ever sing half-hearted. That's a sin. That's a sin. You say, but I don't sing well. Well, I've got good news for you. Nowhere are you required to sing well. You're required to sing loud. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Thank you, choir. I've said this everywhere I go. I believe in America, it should be perfectly legal to shoot a bad choir. <laughs> no, I do. You say, why would you say such a thing? Because a choir can dig a hole that no preacher can get out of. <laughs> Nothing worse than a choir singing half-hearted. Boy, this choir did such an incredible job. And Brother McCurdy, thank you for how you led them. And I was watching your mom and dad here. Brother McCurdy, good to see you. What a thrill. And thank you for singing that song, It Is Well With My Soul. That was written by an attorney. Did you know that? Yeah, Horatio Spafford, a Chicago lawyer, who sent his family on before him to a trip in Europe. And the boat they were on sank. And most of his family perished. But in the midst of it, his law partners came to him and said, you're always talking about your God. What have you got to say now? And he looked at them and he said, it is well with my soul. And then he wrote that. Thank you for singing that. How many of you are thankful it's well with our soul? It is well. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Tonight, for the next few minutes, I want to ask you some critical, critical questions. How many of you figured out America's in a mess? How many of you figured that one out? Now, how many of you figured out Washington's not the answer? By the way, Washington never was the answer. I remember, boy, did we get pulled in when Ronald Reagan was elected. We thought the millennium had come. Well, the millennium come and went. <laughs> and here we are. Please understand, it's not the man in the White House that matters, it's the man on the cross that matters. And don't ever get pulled into this matter that somehow a man is going to make the difference. God has got to make the difference. If America's going to do anything, it's going to be because of the gospel in the local church. But we're in a battle. And the Bible says every child of God is on a battlefield. And I want to ask you this simple question, are you on the right battlefield? You know what I find nationwide? We've got wonderful people that are on the wrong battlefield. June the 6th, 1944 was D-Day. 170,000 soldiers, American, British, Canadian, did the most mammoth attack ever known to man. But sadly, there were soldiers there that were supposed to be a part of D-Day that never got to be. They were paratroopers. And their airplanes flew over the battlefield, and because of cloud cover, they got disoriented. And the pilots took them many, many miles to the wrong battlefield. And when they landed, there was nobody there to fight. So they sat there for several days looking at each other. Hundreds and hundreds of soldiers on the wrong battlefield. And when it came time to get the awards for being involved in D-Day, the commanding officer says, you guys never showed up. You were on the wrong battlefield. And they said, but we meant to be on the right one. We just got dropped in the wrong place. And they said, no. In order to get the award, in order to get the commendation, you got to be on the right battlefield. What battlefield am I on? 
What battlefield are you on? Now, I've got wonderful news this night where we're celebrating the goodness of God. Every battlefield that the Word of God calls you to, you can't fail. Because whatever God commands, God always enables. Let's read what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, would you note here, not the power of your political persuasion. Not the power of your identity in politics. In the power of his might. Have you got God's power? Can you say tonight, by the grace of God, I have the power of God? Well, we're commanded to be strong in his might. Put on, and you know these verses, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, can I remind you, Nancy Pelosi is flesh and blood? How many of you ever let that woman, how many of you get aggravated now and then? <laughs> Boy, when she stood up behind the president, when, how many of you remember that move, right? I'm like, mm. wait a minute. She's not the enemy. That's flesh and blood you're looking at. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, Boy, underscore those words. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. Do you understand? The devil can't get one dart on you because God says the shield of faith quenches every one of them. Whoa. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, verse 18, praying always. We're to pray without ceasing. Have you ever tried one day, just one in your life, to pray without ceasing? Have you ever said, I'm going to, in my relationship with God, he lives in you, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk to him all day. Pray without ceasing, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Have we got you on the right battlefield? This is the most exciting hour to be a Christian, I believe, that's ever existed in the history of our country. And by the way, my comments tonight, please vote. Go out there and remember, your vote does not belong to you. It belongs to Jesus Christ. You're purchased. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. When you walk in that voting booth or when you fill out that absentee ballot, you are voting for Jesus Christ. And how you could ever vote for a candidate not just this for abortion, but wants to accelerate abortion. Can I remind you, we're not to bid evil God's speed. And when you sign that ballot, man, if you vote for that, you're giving it God's speed. Don't you dare do that. But I want you to write down five battlefields tonight that God's promised us victory in. And each and every one of these are by command of Scripture. And boy, I have to keep reminding myself of these battlefields 
In our ministry at the Christian Law Association, every day we're inundated with legal problems. And, and I mean, today I had some lawyers just cuss me out horrible. And something in me wants to go back to the flesh. But God says, I'm commanding these five. And if we're going to win, we've got to win on these battlefields. Now, here's the first battlefield. The battlefield of loving your enemies. The battlefield of love. Can you honestly say from the depths of your heart, by the grace of God, that you love your enemies? Well, Brother Gibbs, come on. That's just not me. That's not any of us. That's why it's got to be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians 13 for just a minute. Now, I want you to look at what God says about this love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, agape, love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, this is God talking to you and me. And you know what God says? A sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal is the irritating noise that merchants make in the marketplace. It's the irritating noise they make to get your attention. If you go to the old part of Jerusalem, they still do it. They screech, they howl. It sounds like fingernails on a blackboard. You know what God says? If you don't have this love, all you are in this world is an irritating noise. Now, this is not the world saying that. This is God saying that. How are you doing on this battlefield? Look at what he says next. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, say out loud the next three words, I am nothing. Whew. I wonder how many days David Gibbs has been a nothing. Without this love, that's all you are, nothing but an irritating noise. Wow. This is an exciting time to be a Christian. Now, turn to Matthew 5. God commands us to love our enemies. Verse 43. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. There's the world's gold standard right there. You be nice to me, I'll be nice to you. You treat me right, I'll treat you right. But you punch me, I punch back. Whoa. That's not God's standard at all. From the lips of Jesus, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Now, how many of you know some irritating people? Hold your hand up, would you? Yeah. You know what I've discovered? The world's full of people that it's possible. It, it's hard to be nice to them, let alone love them. How many of you got some irritating people in your family? Hold your hand up, would you? Yeah. How many of you are sitting next to one right now? <laughs> Look at all the hands. Sure. They're everywhere. And you know what God says to David Gibbs? You're going to win this battle, you're going to love him. Because without it, David, you're nothing but an irritating noise. And without it, you're a nothing. A man wrote a very nasty letter about our ministry years ago, full of lies. I mean, he never talked to us. It was just a terrible letter. But I got mad. How many of you all have ever gotten ticked off? Hold your hand up, would you? Yeah. And I decided to get even. I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to sue you once a day, every day for 30 straight days. 
and I felt great. <laughs> you started it, I'm ending it. Letter came out on a Friday. Called all our lawyers in on Monday. Man, we're going to sue them on Monday. I went and preached on Sunday, came back. Went to my office early Monday morning, and I walked in, and there was my secretary, Mrs. Block. She's in heaven now. She was my secretary for many years. And when I walked in, she said, I saw that letter they sent out. She said, that's terrible. I said, I know. She said, that's full of lies. She said, I've been here 20 years. That's totally not true. I said, I know. She said, I know what you're going to do. I said, yeah, man, I got a great plan, surely. I'm going to make him regret the day he sucked air. <laughs> I'm going to sue him once a day, every day, for 30 straight days. She said, no. You're not going to do that. You're a Christian. You're going to love him. Aren't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> right after I sue him for 30 straight days. I'm going to level this field out. She said, Brother Gibbs, you're commanded to bless him and do good to him. Now, I'm standing there looking at this dear lady, and here, this is honestly what I thought. Lord, right now, I do not need a Christian secretary. I just don't. <laughs> and I really don't need one that knows the Bible. <laughs> she quotes this verse, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. She quotes it verbatim. Do you understand? The devil wanted me on a different field. This is God's battlefield. You know the song, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord? That's this field. She said, promise me you're not going to sue him. You'll break God's heart, Brother Gibbs. Whew. I said, okay, I won't sue him. She said, well, when you pulled up, I saw him. I knew you'd want to tell him you love him. So I dialed him on the phone. He's on line five. <laughs> I looked down line five. It's just a blinking away. Now, Shirley was from West Virginia, but she had Italian in her background. And when she wanted you to do something, she'd always do this. She'd say, tell him you love him. I looked at her and I said, leave me alone. <laughs> she picked the phone up, handed it to me. See, this is easy when it's somebody else. But when it's you, I said, hello. I said, hello. The guy cussed me out. This so-called Christian leader swore at me terrible. I said, you hear that, Shirley? Once a day, every day for 30 straight days. Come on, Shirley. She said, tell him you love him. I said, I just called to tell you I love you. He said, you don't mean that. I thought, boy, are you dead right. <laughs> Listen, this love is never an accident. It's a decision. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Man, when we're ready to go over to the devil's battlefield, we break the heart of God. I told that man, I said, you're a bad man. You've hurt me. But I'm worse than you. I wanted to destroy you. And I ran into a godly secretary who stopped me. Can I tell you what the problem is right now? I don't care which news outlet you watch, Fox, MSNBC, CBS, it doesn't matter. None of them are going to tell you this. They're mad and they want you mad at what they're mad at. And if you're not mad at what they're mad at, then you're not mad right. 
And you know what God says? Get over to the right battlefield. Love your enemies. Yeah, but Brother Gibbs, you don't know my mother-in-law. You don't know my boss. You don't know. You're right, I don't. But here's what I know. Love your enemies. That's your decision. And God will enable you to do that. Remember, filled with his might. Write the second battlefield down. Number one, love is the first one. Number two, joy. Number two, joy, the battlefield of joy. Whew. Isn't it funny how COVID took our joy? Crashing finances took our joy. Can I remind you, joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy. If you're walking in the Holy Spirit, you have to have God's joy. I wonder if the kid's mom would say, mom never loses her joy. Dad never loses his joy. Our pastor never loses his joy. The Apostle Paul, on his way to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, you know the story, the Ephesian elders came and said, don't go, do you not understand what's in front of you? And Paul said, I understand. But he said, none of these things move me, none of these things move me, that I might finish my course with joy. How's your joy? Now, don't confuse joy with happiness. Happiness depends on circumstances. Unsafe people can be happy. They can't be joyful. And nothing can take your joy unless you surrender it. Hmm. I think of my mom. When I was eight and a half years old, she contracted polio. Two and a half years, she's in an iron lung in the hospital, fighting day and night. Just to breathe. Every day we waited for the call, is she alive? After two and a half years, she came home and she can't feed herself, she can't dress, she's strapped in a wheelchair, can't move. And my dad said, let's Let's have family devotions. And my dad said, what do you want to give thanks for to my mom? Never forget, she said, that he's given me joy. He's given you what? Joy. What does it take to squelch your joy? You're no better of a Christian than what it takes to make joy take flight. The world's watching. I'll never forget in a courtroom, a judge had heard some things about this from pastors, and he pulled me aside and he said, do I understand that you have a divine resource of joy? Your God gives you joy? I said, that's a good way to say it, a divine resource of joy. He said, then how come it don't show? Uh, would you write this down? You can't hide joy. You say, I'm joyful, it just doesn't show. Now not only are you not joyful, you're lying on top of it. Joy, never controlled by circumstances. Wow. Number one on the battlefield of love. Number two, on the battlefield of joy. Write number three down, the battlefield of peace. Philippians chapter four, verse six through seven. Do you understand we have a divine resource of peace? Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the God of peace 
shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus with a peace that passeth all understanding. Oh, these are battlefields. And these are the battlefields that matter. The battlefield, if you will, of love and of joy and of peace. Write number four down, endurance. The battlefield of endurance. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What does it take to rock your endurance? A dear friend of mine, Earl Lee, was in Russia just by happenstance when the wall came down. And for the first time, pastors could hold services in Russia. And he went to one of those services and there was a man there who'd been in prison five times. He'd been mercilessly beaten and starved and all he had to do to get out of prison was say, I won't preach Jesus anymore. They said, renounce Jesus and you're free. But he said no, and they beat him and beat him. Now suddenly he's free because the wall came down. And Earl Lee went to hear him preach. And the man said, I almost gave in. He said they found out that beating, and by the way, could they beat you and you stand firm? Could they take everything you have? Or do we love the good life too much? Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Christianity can survive anything but prosperity. He said, people give in and trade Christianity for prosperity almost every time. Never been a country prosperous like ours. Do you have endurance to stand for the faith? This man said, I almost gave in when they brought my oldest daughter in. And they said, we beat you so many times, we broke every bone you have. We've mangled your face but we think we're going to get you to do it this time, because if you don't, we're going to deafen your daughter with hot pokers in her ears. And then we're going to remove her tongue. She'll never hear another word. She'll never be able to speak another word. And all you have to do is renounce Jesus and say you won't preach him. That's it. You're out. What would you do? In door hardness. His daughter said, Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Don't you dare give him. And in his presence, nearly driving this precious dad insane, they harmed his daughter. Then they brought the second daughter in and did the same. And she said, don't you dare give in. Then the third daughter. This preacher said, I almost lost my mind. Now he's standing up here preaching. And Earl Lee said, over here in the corner are three, three ladies that they're signing to. And I asked, are those the daughters? And they said, they are. And he said, can I talk to them? And they said, sure. He walked over and through a sign interpreter he said, I, I want to ask you this question. 
Are you bitter? And he said, the minute I did that, their hands just flew in unison. And he said, what'd they say? What'd they say? They said it was our reasonable sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable sacrifice. Brother Gibbs, you think anything like that's going to come here? Boy, I pray not. But I'm seeing stuff come now I didn't think would ever come. But here's the question. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, I've never seen a man made by a crisis. He said, the crisis just exposes the man for what he already is. What would it take for you to renounce Christ? What would it take for you to not endure? Maybe that's easy for you. Boy, I've, I've thought and thought of that, Brother Willette. What would I do? Here's what I know. I know God gives grace, but these are hard things. And it's the battlefield. The battlefield of love and of joy and of peace and of endurance. Write the fifth battlefield down and we're done. The battlefield of hope. The battlefield of hope. Psalm 16, verse 9. Therefore my Lord is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh shall rest in hope. Psalm 31, 24. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Psalm 71, 5. For thou art my hope, O Lord. How's your hope? Now I want you to catch this and we're done tonight. There's three kinds of hope. Two of which the world understands and one of which they can't understand. The first kind of hope is what I just call a wishful hope. A wishful hope. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope. I hope that policeman didn't see me speeding. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. That's just wishful thinking. Did you ever take a test you hadn't studied for right? Boy, I did. I didn't have to pray for God to bring things to my remembrance. I needed divine things to happen. I hope, I hope, I hope. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope Donald Trump wins. Oh, I hope, I hope. That's just wishful thinking. That's not hope in the scripture. That's just wishful thinking. I go to Dairy Queen, and I hope I don't gain any weight. <laughs> That's wishful thinking. The second hope is expectant hope. This is where you did something hoping an outcome, but you don't control the outcome. I grew up on farms, and we planted thousands of acres of corn. Man, we did everything we could to get a harvest, but, and we hoped for a harvest, but if you didn't get the rain at the right time, if you didn't get the sun at the right time, if you could keep the bugs out, because you couldn't control it. But you did all you could, so there's an expectant hope. That's not the hope in Scripture. Our hope is not whimsical, it's not wishful, it is not expectant. Our hope is a certain hope. Absolute certain. There are 7,000 promises in the Word of God, and every one of them is certain, absolutely certain. Have you got that hope? That hope? Turn and book, if you would please, to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. 
that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, and, and please underline that, your God never lies, never. Impossible for God. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. That's this word, a certain hope. But look at what he says about this hope. Which hope we have is an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. We have a hope that's an anchor for the soul. Have you got that hope? Are you anchored? An anchor does two things. If you're a mariner, you know these two things. The first thing an anchor does is it keeps you from drifting. If you want to stay in a certain place, you put down an anchor. And it keeps you from drifting. You know what? We got people, especially young people, drifting everywhere. Because they don't have an anchor. How's your anchor? Is it keeping you from drifting? But the second thing an anchor does, when a storm is severe, you always let the anchor out because it keeps you into the wind. It takes you through the worst of storms. It keeps you from drifting, and it takes you through the worst of storms. My law partner, Charlie Craze, for many years, was in the Navy for quite a while. And he was on these huge military ships. But he said, we would get in typhoons and hurricanes that, that, that would destroy the ship, and we always let out the anchor. And when they let out the anchor, we knew we'd be okay. The anchor for the soul keeps you from drifting and it takes you through the storm. Have you got that anchor? The battlefield of love, the battlefield of joy, of peace, of endurance, the battlefield of an anchor. A young man by the name of Charles Tinley was born to a free mother but a slave father. And by law, in the mid-1800s, he should have been free. But a very wicked man bought him and treated him like a slave. When Charles Tinley said, listen, my, my mother was free this wicked man said, the problem with you is you're uppity. And so in front of everybody, they beat him mercilessly. Tied him to a whipping toast and beat him for an hour and a half. I want to show you how free you are. A year later, Charles, a slave, asked one of the ladies, is there a way I could learn to read? I'd like to know how to read. And when this wicked slaveholder found that out, he said, you don't want to learn how to read. I'm going to drive that out of you. And they whipped them again, only this time they whipped them on the front. They took his face apart. They whipped them right down to his rib cage. At the end of the Civil War, he was freed, severely, severely disabled from how he was treated. And he made his way to Philadelphia. And a Baptist church found him living on the street. And a lady in the church said, I'm sure we can put you up in the basement of the church. Let's get you off the street. And Charles said, could you teach me how to read? I'd like to know how to read the Bible. Could you teach me how? She said, I will, and she did. Charles Tinley, when he started reading the Bible, quickly became saved. And Charles Tinley started taking hope. He said, I was a man with no hope. But I have 7,000 promises that are my hope. He was self-taught. 
he studied the scripture and they had him take over a small chapel and he started building that church through evangelism for Christ. When Charles Tinley was done, his church never had less than 5,000 people in it on Sunday. And Charles Tinley of God wrote some songs. He wrote the song, Take Your Burden to the Lord and Leave It There. The Philadelphia Inquirer came to him and said, how do you explain what all you went through? And he wrote the song, we'll understand it better by and by. He said, nothing's going to take my hope. Toward the end of his life, they said, what have you learned? And he wrote the song, Stand By Me. A young man who had nothing had hope. How are you on that battlefield? The battlefield of love and of joy and of peace and endurance and the battlefield of hope. Be careful that the devil doesn't pull you over. I've won, I pray hard for this next election. But the election's in God's hands. These battlefields are in our hands. Because every one of them is a command of scripture. And whatever God commands, God will enable. Lester Roloff, how many of you know the name Lester Roloff? was in jail wrongfully. I remember them walking him out of the courtroom in chains. And I said, I'll be back in the morning. And at 5 a.m. I saw him in jail. I'll never forget, I said, how are you doing? He said, the Bible says I'm doing fine. That's what he said. He said, David, nothing's going to take my hope. Nothing. Your strength is in hope. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And now it's time for God's people, with all the goodness of God, we can change things, but we got to get to the right battlefield. Start with love, your enemies. Start with joy. My circumstances aren't going to control it. God is. With peace that passeth all understanding. The peace of God. And start with endurance. Endure hardness. I don't know what we're going to have to endure. But whatever it is, we can win. Because our God's commanded victory. And then our hope. Wow. I was thankful to hear on these videos you did about people trusting Christ. Do you understand? We want them not just to know Jesus for eternity. We want them to have the hope of God now. The hope that changes everything. Tonight, I want to ask you a simple question. Would you get on the right battlefield? Would you, by the grace of God, say, I'm going to obey his command. Bow your head in prayer. Father, what a thrill to know you are our Father. What a joy to know you've commanded us to have love and joy and peace and endurance. That by your grace, by your power, we can win every one of these battles, every time. But the decision is in our hands. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, Brother Gibbs, God spoke to my heart tonight. I want to get on the right battlefield. If that's true, hold your hand up right now. Hold your hand high. Hold it high. If you raised your hand, I want you to quietly slip to the aisle. I'm not going to bring you down front. But go as far as you can. Just 
bow and kneel. Do not go to the front. What a thrill to know that our God calls us to the battlefield. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Father, I bow with these people tonight. May we leave here knowing how good our God is. Oh, my soul. That you let us serve you. You don't need us. You're God. You're all powerful but you permit us to go on these battlefields to show this world what you can do through us. And Father, tonight, we're making the decision to obey, the decision to obey, starting with loving our enemies. Hear our cry. May we leave your touch, not by my words, but the power of the word of God. Hear our cry in Jesus' name. And all God's children together said, Amen. Amen. the phone asked me a simple question four days ago he said who do you think is going to win I said God every time he said no I mean in the election I said God every time do you understand winning is in God's hands standing is in our hands and our job is to be on the right battlefield standing standing a dear pastor friend of mine in California has Nancy Pelosi as his Congress lady. And so he made an appointment to go see her. And when he got there, she came out and she said, what do you want? I don't have much time. What do you want? And he said, well, this won't take long. I just come to tell you three words. I love you. She said, you what? He said, my faith commands me to love you, and I do. She said, do you understand no one's ever said that? He said, well, I'm saying it. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. It's called the battlefield. That lady still calls that preacher. You know this preacher well, Pastor Willett. It's the power of the right battlefield. I want you to turn whoever you're sitting next to and tell your neighbor, God help him, I'm going to love my enemies. Tell him, God help him, I'm going to love my enemies. Now turn back to your neighbor and say, I want you to do it too. Tell who's sitting next to you. This is never an accident. This is done by the grace of God. I'm so excited for what's happening in America. Grieved, concerned, oh, you bet. But on the right battlefield, we never lose. We never lose. Because we're obeying the commands that Jesus has given us.